Hello, I'm Jamie Johnson, and here with me today is Dean Knutson, representative from uh, the Assembly District representing Hudson and River Falls area. Uh, Dean, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. And uh, I asked Dean um, on rather short notice uh, to come and help explain some of the things that are going on. Uh, Dean had been a guest of mine in a prior show, Power News, and was one of the last guests on that show. And now uh, he's back with having been in the assembly less than two full months. And there's already been a little bit in the paper about what's going on down in Madison. Also a little bit on national news as well. So specifically what we're talking about is the budget repair bill. And let's explain a little bit about, first of all, the budgeting process for Wisconsin. Uh, it's a two-year biennium budget, is that correct? Correct. We budget in a two-year cycle. Each one starts uh, July 1st of uh, the odd-numbered years, and it goes forward for two years. So we're just finishing our, the last few months of a budget cycle, and then we'll be uh, discussing over the next few months the new budget. This current budget year is coming up with a shortfall. Whenever our budget has a shortfall of a significant amount by law, we need to address that. And we were going to have a shortfall before the end of the year and need to address it. So Governor Walker decided to address it right now, try to put things right going forward for the rest of this budget, but also the changes that are being made will play a big role in putting us on a better financial footing for the next budget year. Okay. So we have the significant amount, you said, as far as a shortfall. How does that give us, again, um, a perception of what the budget is for a two-year cycle? How many billion, billions of dollars are spent and collected? Yeah, so, you know, you can look at... Um, what's called the GPR budget, which is general pur purpose revenue. That's, that's, that's the, one, the one form. On that basis, um, shared revenue is about half of what we spend. So that's revenues coming to local school districts, cities, counties, towns, all the municipalities. Corrections is about 9%. Colleges and universities, about 9%. 9% here is about a billion dollars. Okay. Okay, so colleges and universities get about a, is around a billion. Uh, corrections, again, around a billion. Um, so those are some big numbers. Then you've got the Medicaid program, which in Wisconsin is, um, covers those that have incomes up to 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, by law now it has to go to 133%. Many states were at 100%. So if you were below the poverty line, you were eligible. Above the poverty line, you weren't. Um, some states had been at 133%, some at 150%. Wisconsin's been at 200%. So we've been very generous with that program. And that program has become very expensive as um, health care costs have increased. So that's a large piece of our budget. And um, so the total budget tough. for a two-year period, we're talking about $22 billion then? So 20 to $22 yeah. billion in that range. Right. And so when we hear and Minnesota is, I think, comparable in their spending, but their last couple of shortfalls, when they go into a new budget year, they always seem to be about 5 to $6 billion short. Wisconsin's been in that three to five billion range for the last couple of budgets. But again, we're also going to get into what's considered a, a shortfall or a deficit and, uh, and how you calculate that. But basically... You can get into some pretty arcane and maybe boring for people numbers, but um, in Wisconsin we use cash basis accounting. We are required to have a balanced budget on a cash basis, um, meaning that I use the analogy of if we're two neighbors, this is our property line, we decide we're going to cut down a tree, Jamie. 
and it's right on the line. We're going to share the cost. So you pay someone to do it. It was $1,000. I owe you $500 for my share, right? Gentleman's agreement. Okay, you just had a cash expense because you paid for it. Now I owe you the $500. When will I pay you? When is it due? You know, we owe the state of Minnesota for the reciprocity agreement that was ended, we owe $57 million. They have demanded payment. Governor Dayton has demanded payment. And yet, under Wisconsin's accounting rules, Governor Doyle took the approach that that's not due until 2012. Governor Walker's taken the approach that that's due in 2011. It's just a difference of and by, opinion. In 2011, because our budget years actually end in the middle of 2011. Correct. So it's... Well, he's still, you know, so it needs to be dealt with is one thing. And we get our revenues from, you could say, maybe three main sources. Sales tax, income tax, other sources like federal uh, sharing. So the Medicaid program is generally, it's a 60-40 share, state, federal. Uh, last year there were a lot of federal stimulus dollars. We got over a billion dollars of federal stimulus money that won't be there this year. Sales tax revenues have been down. Historically, in good times they're strong, in bad times they're not as strong, but over a period of 20 plus years they never went down. In this recession they actually went down, in real numbers went down. So that's a big hit. Um, income tax, obviously. We got families that um, have lost one job, in some cases both, uh, sure. both members. Um, it was not the income tax revenue coming in that there has been. We, in the last budget, um, took the approach of increasing taxes. Um, taxes and fees were increased in Wisconsin around $5 billion in the last budget year, a budget cycle. And the taxpayers were very clear in the last election, they don't want more tax increases. They want us to cut spending. That, that was a very clear message. Um, you saw no one from either party really running on the idea that, hey, what we need to do now is increase taxes. They maybe talked about, you know, here and there, but if you added up the total impact of any tax increases being proposed, it was very small. Certainly not enough to balance the budget. Sure. So we came to Madison this time with a, with a clear message that we heard and took to heart, and it's that it's time to find ways to cut spending. So that's what this is about, and it's painful. Cutting spending is painful. Tomorrow the governor introduces his budget, and there's going to be painful, painful cuts. There's, there's a signal that a billion dollar cut in the funds that would be given to school districts and the governmental units. Yes, the shared revenues um, to school districts, to counties and cities, the number that I expect will be in there is somewhere around a billion dollars in it's those called cuts. state aid. State aids, right. It's so that's going to come for the 2011 through 2013 um, budget biennium. But let's just focus on this budget repair bill, mm -hmm. what's going to happen now between now and the yeah. June 30th. And we're talking a hundred, what is the number? Because I've heard 135 million, I've heard 165 million, but either way we're talking an amount that's less than 2% of the budget, a yeah. little over 1%, is that right? Well, one of the big components to it was to take some debt and refinance it. And there's a deadline to be able to do the, the bond sale for that of this week. Um, that would have saved $165 million out of this year's budget. Um, so that would have taken care of the whole shortfall, just refinancing the That's debt. the biggest component of it. The, the, the Medicaid system will be broke. I mean, we will not be able to pay providers through Medicaid by about April or May if we don't do something. So some, if not this budget repair bill, Something's going to have to happen, and we'll have to make cuts elsewhere, and it might mean layoffs or something else, but we will have to make cuts during this budget year of some sort in order to stay afloat. So those that have said that this is all a made-up problem, there was no problem, well, there was no problem because the Doyle administration was assuming money 
would come from the federal government that is not in evidence, isn't going to be in evidence. So there were assumptions made to keep a rosier scenario going there. In other words, you can make anything look better or make it look worse. I would say um, Governor Doyle was trying to make things look pretty good. And um, the fact of it is we've got a big budget problem. Okay. But you say big budget problem and significant dollars that this budget repair bill can be addressed even if it's less than 2% of what the budget biennium is. Well, there's two big components to this budget repair bill. Um, the first part does have an immediate effect on the budget month by month by month. So from the time of enactment, asking um, all participants in Wisconsin retirement system, so that's the state-run pension system for public employees, all participants are being asked to pay their half again. That's the way the system was originally set up. Later it was modified to allow employers to pay the employee's share. And then through the collective bargaining system, um, employees bargained for getting that employer paid pension both the employer side and the employee side. And so uh, almost all public employees in Wisconsin today have the employer pay for the entire pension. They got that and then the cost of the pension plan went up and up. And so in order to continue providing that kind of a defined benefit pension plan is very expensive. And so that's the key component here. What's the second key component then? The second part is collective bargaining reform. Okay, well the first part has the pension part and health care um, for state employees. That doesn't affect as many people, but for state employees it does. And that includes teachers, right? No. The, uh, is a very good point, Jamie, okay. because there's been some misinformation on that. It, it doesn't. It, um, the uh, state health insurance plan covers state employees, so it would cover a corrections officer, it covers someone working for a Department of Revenue, if you're a highway patrolman, but if you're a teacher or you work for a county, then most counties are not on the state health insurance plan. In our area, the city of Hudson was the last municipality still on the state health insurance plan, and we went off it a couple of years ago. Pierce County is not on it, St. Croix County employees are not on it, none of our local school districts are on the state health insurance plan. They're either on the WEA Trust, so the Wisconsin Education Association Trust is the teachers union, health insurance, teachers union providing the insurance that the district is buying. That's the most common for, um, for school districts. Okay, so um, that's really not part then of the budget repair, really. Correct. It's not a direct so benefit. It, it is not in a direct sense. For those state employees or for other municipal employees that are, are they're, we're, you know, they're using the state plan, the new law says the employer may only pay up to 88%. The employee must pay their 12%. But for schools, counties, everyone who's on some other plan, what this says is um, it'll be up to the employer to decide because right now that's been done through collective bargaining. And under the new plan, I mean, you could, the employer will have enormous flexibility. So this means local elected officials will have unprecedented flexibility and accountability. Because there's going to be one-year contracts and by one year contract, you're talking about the union needs to recertify every year. The contract that the union bargains for now, the, the collective bargaining reform will be restricted to only on wages and only up to the cost of living increase for the base wages. The employer, the, the let's, for purposes of simplicity, instead of me saying employer, let, let's just use the example of education. So let's just say school board. Right. So right now the school board... Knowing says, that this has broader impact. But it has broader impact. It gotcha. does. It, it applies to counties, cities, towns. But let's just use the school board here as an example. Right now the way contracts are done is the uh, teachers union representative gets together with school board. They come to the table. They have a bargain. 
and they will bargain over all kinds of things. Uh, health insurance, pay, work conditions, length of the school year and um, early releases. Time, early yeah. release. It's it's um, for I mean there are AFSCME contracts where the um, the wallpaper in the office is a bargain thing. It, it it there's nothing that's can't be bargained and there are many things in the current law that must be bargained that are mandatory. In the new plan <clears throat> the only thing will be base wages. So um, uh, bonus plans, performance pay, incentive pay, none of that is included. So the school board now will have unlimited ability to construct those kind of compensation schemes. And those are not covered under the wage plus inflation. So they can, they can devise any kind of compensation plan they want to. Steps. And it's just that, they, that the union won't be able to bargain. It won't be bargained. It'll be done by the school board. Okay. And, but the bargain for the base wage, they'll still get together and they'll bargain that base wage on an annual basis. So every year there will be a bargain. It'll start in the summer. It'll go on. If they decide that they want it, the base wage to go over um, inflationary increase, then it has to go to a referendum. And the referendum would be in November. So then a new contract goes into effect January 1st for the next year. And probably most of the time the base wage will be going up with inflation. I think you could guess that that's what will happen. Sure. Now I understand, and, and, I, and you're explaining it very well, and I, I understand how this is going to impact uh, the, the next school year's budget and the next school year's budget after that and so forth. Yep. But how is that going to save any money um, eliminating the union's ability to bargain the health care, for instance, and save the state money between now and the end of June 2011? Well, um, as teacher contracts expire, and again, I'm using teachers, but teachers aren't being, sure. you know, um, it's not solely teachers. But as the contracts expire, then the new rules come into effect. Because our collective bargaining process has been so broken, I mean, it's, it's really a failed process, it's, it's time consuming, it's expensive, and it, it has led to increased costs for the taxpayers. But it's also just a broken process. It's very rare for um, a new contract to be settled before the old one is expired and often expired long ago. Sure. So there are lots of contracts that, you know, may be going to be up between now and the end of the year, which does allow in some cases you'll, you, there will be immediate changes that the school boards could make, almost immediate changes, or the county boards, if they, are, if they don't have a, a current uh, collective bargaining contract in place. If they do, then that's in effect until it expires. Okay. So but back to the health insurance. Okay. So you asked, does, they, does the 88% employer and 12%, is that a, a mandate? No, it's not. Actually, what will happen now for local employers like school boards and county boards is they will have the flexibility to create whatever system they want. The provider, which currently, because of collective bargaining, most schools are, have been locked into buying their insurance from one provider, and it's the teachers' union plan. Sure. Um, in Hudson, for example, they could save a million dollars a year just by having the same plan provided by a different provider. Um, or very similar plan, if not exactly the same. Now the school boards under this new plan, they'll be able to construct whatever health insurance plan they want to as part of a total compensation plan. They could pay 100% of it. In theory, they could pay 0%. They could have a deductible of 0, or they could have a deductible of $100. Or they could make it consistent with what the norm is in the private sector. They could, with one key point. They have to stand for election. They have to, vote re they have to recruit and retain quality teachers in a competitive marketplace, very competitive, 
more competitive than it used to be because it's going to be the, hey, now if New Richmond offers better health insurance than Hudson, teachers can move. But also, those school board members and county board members are going to be up for election. In the spring elections, if, if a new contract went to into effect January 1st, what do you think will happen to the school board member who just voted to ask for uh, teachers to pay 50% of their health insurance or something? I mean, this is so the you piece think that people help. don't... I mean, they've already been standing for election already, and we haven't seen any wild swings, at least not locally in our school board. Some school boards, yes, they get one divisive issue and you'll see a big swing. But what you're saying is that this is going to take out the extreme movement from what we have. We might have some adjustments, for instance, on the popular notion that this is going to increase the teacher's portion of their health care by 12% because that's what the, you know, has been in the media and you're explaining that that's not necessarily so because it's just providing the it's flexibility. Just, it's just plain misinformation. Okay. I mean, there but, are teachers who are given information from their union in the first week of this plan. Some of them came to Madison and I'm, you know, I had an open door policy while I'm in Madison. Um, I've the office is open. I've talked with hundreds of teachers and people that were upset and unhappy about this. And when we actually sat down and talked about it like this, almost every time they've been given misinformation to scare them, and they've been very scared. It's not that this isn't going to be painful. It's very painful. For a state employee, it's about an 8% pay cut right away. For teachers, not so much. It's about a 6% change for right. them in putting in the... Because that 6% uh, relates specifically to the pension The part. pension contribution, exactly. Okay. And not that that's not painful, it is. And there are family budgets that will be extremely stressed and strained by that, and everybody understands that. I mean, you know, I, I, trust me, before this budget is done, everyone will see that it's either that or there are going to be layoffs, because there's no other way. The money is in paying for the compensation of personnel. That's where the money is. Either you'll have fewer people to pay or you're going to pay them less. And I want to there talk isn't about any that. other way. I want to talk about that because our governor has said that it's either my way or else. I'm going to, if this budget isn't passed, this budget repair isn't passed, we're going to start laying off 1,000 employees a week until we get what we want type sure. of thing. Now, I don't know about a thousand a week, but well, there's been different numbers thrown about, but we'd have to lay off five thousand employees to equal the savings that they're seeking through this, and the refinancing of the debt, which I think is a very important component to this, and we can't forget that that needs to get done um, in order to reduce the pain and sacrifice that's going to be felt by real family budgets. Mm -hmm. But getting back to this notion of what needs to be done now versus what could be done as part of the next biennium, biennium budget? That is what the governor is going to propose tomorrow. We hear a lot of public employees saying, I'm fine with paying 12% of my health care. I'm fine with paying half of my pension. Just don't take away my collective bargaining rights. And why does that have to be done now as opposed to make it something that would be in effect for yeah. July 1, 2011? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you, number one, um, there have, has been a complete change over the two-week history of this giant statewide and nas nationwide conversation. In the first week, no one was saying that, hey, this is just fine, we're happy to make those payments. In the second week, the story was changed. There was a new spin. It was, oh, well, we're fine with making the pension and the health insurance contributions. Just don't make any changes to collective bargaining. And yet, what you've seen around the state is there are bargaining units that are scrambling to try to get contracts. Not one of them have made those same concessions that everybody is saying, hey, these are just fine. And um, down in Madison, you know, I can tell you that the posters that are being posted say, you know, tell them it's okay now in order to protect the collective bargaining, because as soon as that's over, we'll change that. I've used the analogy of, hey, it's like if you've got a sticky accelerator on your car and uh, that gas pedal is sticking once in a while and you're going faster than you want to go, 
then clearly you need to do something. I mean, let's reach down and unstick it. That's fine. But we got to address the problem that led to that as well. And it's the collective bargaining has become unworkable for public, in, for public unions. I mean, you can go back to what President Roosevelt, when FDR said, it just won't work because the public unions are going to be able to elect the people on the other side of the table from them, and sooner or later they'll figure that out, and they have figured that out. In every election at every level, they're active. Um, from the county board, you had the, um, right here in St. Croix County, you had um, the public employee unions in the last election very active in the county board races, very openly and, and um, uh, actively involved in those county board races. The teachers union is very involved in electing school board members and so on up the way. When you get to the point of um, really stepping back and looking at this, you see that FDR was probably right. So, and so we have to address the collective bargaining reform. So there have been compromises proposed, and I'll tell you just three of them that I've heard, and I'll tell you why probably they're not going to go anywhere. Can you address the one first that I've heard, and I actually saw it on national news? And we've been talking about this issue for uh, several minutes now, and I started the whole program off, the segment off, with a little bit of sarcasm, saying it's been in the news. But I think most people have heard that the state senate on this same uh, subject, the budget repair bill, has not been in session. Uh, the Democrats, 14 of them, walked out their one shy of a quorum and have basically fled the state uh, to Indiana, similar or to Illinois, similar to the Indiana state legislature where similar legislation is being proposed mm -hmm. and holding out for some type of compromise offer. Um, and the governor has been on record saying he's not going to compromise. The uh, state senator, Dale Schultz, who's from southern part of the state, I saw him on Fox News indicating that he would have a compromise or maybe this would be in effect for two years under the, I think his, his reasoning was that uh, we need to get things straight and we need to go back to ground zero and maybe we extend that two years but allow it to have some type of end point uh, now just to get it passed so that we can move forward, get the debt refinanced and move on. His offer of compromise was not met very well by the Fox host. Why is Dale Schultz's compromise offer not going to work? Yeah. Again, you have to get back to the fact that either the system works and needs to be maintained or it doesn't work and we need to reform and modify it. And if it doesn't, then doing some sort of a Band-Aid solution like that is the same old thing that we've been practicing down in Madison. And I say we, I mean, it's, I'm there now, um, of saying, look, here's a short-term yeah. fix. Okay. Instead of just addressing things like adults and saying, look, we're going to tell the truth. We're not going to play games. We're not going to do something and say, look, we'll do this for a year and then it'll be back again. Um, we're going to do something and do it right so that we've got things set, not just for this two-year budget, but for the next four and six and ten years. Because, I mean, how long has it been, Jamie, since you didn't hear every year that we had a structural deficit in Wisconsin? Which essentially means we've made promises that we can't keep. You know, we've, we've promised more spending than the income that's going to come in. And it's happened year after year after year after year after year. And you know what got us there? That exact kind of thinking. Senator Schultz's plan, frankly, it's going to go nowhere. Because it doesn't do what we need to do, which is start to think long term. Somebody said one time, you know, I've been involved in local politics. And in local politics, you have to look people right in the eye and say, no, we're not going to rezone your property. Right. And they're unhappy with you, and, but you get used to the fact that you just have to say no sometimes. And parents are very used to this. I mean, you take your typical 16-year-old who wants to stay out all night at some party with, you know, and you say no, and that's not right for you. You can't do it. And there will be a lot of unhappiness, yet you know that it's really it's what right, what is right, and you're trying to look at the greater good and the long-term picture. And that's what we need to do. 
You know, somebody said one time, if you'd spend 5% of your time as an elected official worrying about the short-term good and 95% of your time worrying about the long-term good, we'll start to make the kind of tough decisions that really benefit people for the future. This is not about short-term gain, believe me. It's about short-term pain, and it's pain for everybody involved, pain for the people that are having to accept a new way, painful for the people politically that, I mean, honestly, it isn't like this is great for re-elections, right? Make a whole segment of the population. How about this? People say, why don't you go down there and do battle with the special interest groups? What is the biggest and most powerful political force in the state of Wisconsin? Doctors. It's the teachers union by far. <laughs> okay. Makes your trial lawyers look puny, Jamie. Yeah. I mean, it's the teachers union by far. You could take the three biggest conservative political groups, combine them together, and they're just getting as big as the teachers union, as a political force in Wisconsin. Look at who spends all the money. It's the single largest special interest group there is. Who would ever dare tackle that interest group? It takes courage to do that, I'll tell you, because there's a lot of potent political action. You're going to see it. I mean, that machine is in full force right now, protecting the status quo. But the fact is, the status quo won't work anymore. But, but, but Dean, the, this, when you say status quo, they're offering compromises. Where? They're, they're Who? Mary Bell's the, he, the head of WEAC on a statewide level, and she has said, this is fine. But there's still contract negotiations going on all over. You haven't heard sudden settlements going on where they came in and said, look, we'll do all this stuff. We'll give you all these things that you want. Well, don't you think they're waiting to see what's going to play out in Madison? Yeah, the contrary. They're trying their best to go enter into three- and four-year contracts, which will postpone the flexibility that we're talking about for their district right now. I mean, there's, there's a big movement to try to enter into contracts right now to try to postpone when this would become... Um, okay, but you, were, you said there was three compromises. We talked about the Dale Schultz, which is let's... Um, make these cuts that we need to make, get the debt refinanced, and balance this budget yep. for the rest of the biennium, and then for the next biennium, uh, allow there to be no, basically no collective bargaining other than with the limit of yeah, wages well, the only. Other, the others would be to, in, a, in the same vein, instead of it being calendar-based, that you'd make these changes for a while, and on a certain calendar day, we'd go way back to the old failed system. Or it could be based on some economic indicator whether it be the, um, some budget health, that when our, when our budget was in a certain state, that this would, you know, collective bargaining would be um, suspended or reformed during that time. Uh, maybe it could be unemployment. You know, get unemployment down to a certain amount, then, you know, here's, you say, hey, the economy's humming along. This is a good time to go back to saying, hey, Let's do this. You know, it's just, it's been an impediment to progress. I mean, you take just in education. When President Obama comes to Wisconsin and says, performance pay for teachers would be a way to improve education for our young people. He brings his Secretary of Education who says the same thing, and the governor of the state of Wisconsin says the same thing. But the teachers union is against it and refuses to go there so that we have no movement towards that. While it's widely accepted that that ought to become at least part of the way that we compensate teachers. So you're in favor of what wrong President Obama is in favor of the, the pre performance pay. That's a big part of what's going on here. Because the, if you cap it at the CPI, that is any increases in wages. Or the, the base wage. Right, the base wage. And then... Performance pay is exempted from that. And that's what I'm saying is that that would be a way for school districts to get back to give teachers that um, have the performance that they would be able to earn more than just the CPI exactly. without having to go to a referendum. Exactly. Okay. And not just, not just um, teachers. I mean, it applies to public employees in, in all, all different avenues. Okay. We've, we talked about, and you had mentioned, I think maybe it was before we went on camera, that was about $10 million that just the pension end of it saves. Is that correct for state employees and the teachers? 
contributing to their own pension, that 6% would save the state about $10 million a month. Right around that. Okay. And then we have these other savings of trying to rein in the ability of the unions to negotiate everything else, including the, uh, the pattern of the wallpaper. How much is this going to save in the next biennium by doing that? What's going to be saved? Dollars-wise, by eliminating just the collective bargaining, not talking about the pension part of it, but just the collective bargaining and eliminating them as an ability to have any collective bargaining. How much money will that save? It's yet to be seen whether the collective bargaining changes happen. But the cuts to local aid are happening either way. Sure. If the local governments have to deal with those cuts to local aid without this new flexibility, they are going to be in a tough spot. No one wants them to push that on to the local property taxes and increase property taxes. And those local officials don't want to do it either. But they're going to be in a position where now you've got to cut either programs and services or you've got to cut personnel. And, um, but with this plan, they'll have flexibility to do other things. And, it, you know, it's hard to put a number on it. It'll be hard to define the savings that come from it, but there will be savings. Okay. I uh, have to address one more thing. I, mean, I know we're getting close on our time here, but what ab why exempt firefighters, police, and the, and the state patrol? Yeah. The governor's idea in doing that is that there is going to be a lot of turmoil and disruption during the time that this new system is being implemented. And he stated that while he hopes for the best and assumes the best, it's his job to do contingency planning for the worst. And the worst case is if some sector of public employees decided not to come to work. And if they decide not to come to work, then what would be the contingency plan? And, you know, he stated at the outset that he, you know, we have good, loyal, dedicated public uh, employees, and he expected that they'd all be on the job doing their job. But if not, then there needs to be planning. And he could not come up with a viable contingency plan to replace local firefighters and local policemen were they to not come to work. I take that at face value. Within five minutes of hearing that, I challenged the wisdom of that to both um, his staff and the Secretary of Administration. Because for one thing, as a fiscal conservative, uh, there's a lot of savings there if we would have applied it uniformly. In other words, for example, at the city of Hudson, um, it's about a third of the budget is in uh, the cost of, of, of police and fire. A lot of places, police and fire is a half of the budget. And so there's potential savings there that by just being uniform would have been saved. Um, but I take him at his word. I never would have thought that we'd have had that kind of action happen, but we had it happen right here in Hudson. And, you know, um, so it may have been wise By to proceed. By it happened, you mean the, the, the day that work the teachers action. weren't here? Work action. Okay. I mean, you can call it a wildcat strike or a sick out or whatever you want to call it, but, I mean, they got together in a room and decided not to come to work. Um, there would be nothing to apologize for. The head of the teachers' union has now issued an apology for that. There would be nothing to apologize for if it had happened spontaneously. It didn't happen spontaneously. They got together in a room, had input from the state um, union officials, and decided what they were going to do. They were being encouraged to take a work action, and they did it. Um, you know, there's still talk out there about a general strike, and a general strike in Wisconsin would mean, or could mean, that you have lots of different public employees that don't show up. So the idea that there was contingency planning done, I think, is, I mean, it's what I would have done as a mayor. So if that happens, if there is a think strike, about those things. what's the contingency plan? If the, if the teachers strike, then, if there is a general strike? Well, unfortunately, you saw what the contingency plan for teachers is. It would, you'd have to bring in substitutes, but otherwise, you have to close schools and education stops and the kids are at home, and that's a shame. And it made... It made a lot of parents pretty unhappy. But, so it's okay to have no school, but we can't do without firefighters and police. I'm trying to 
if get it. the house is burning down and the kids are upstairs because they're home from school, then I think we probably better have somebody that knows how to fight a fire. And it's hard to bring in someone who's never fought a fire before to do that. And whereas, you know, for a lot of other jobs, you can find someone in the private sector that could do that job for a short term if they had to. Um, I mean, who wants to have this conversation? I don't. I'm a glass is half full guy, and I honestly, I agree that I'm optimistic. I don't think that that's going to happen. Part of it is, as, as we move forward, I think people are going to see that, hey, um, Two-thirds of the public employees in the United States don't have collective bargaining the way we've had in, in for Wisconsin. Federal employees don't have it. In many states, it's, it's, it's curtailed such as this, or they don't have it. Um, there are still civil service protections to cover grievance procedures, termination, employee discipline, so you still have rights and protections there. Um, and um, so there really isn't any reason to go on strike. Okay. But the exception on firefighters and, and the police and the state patrol, it's, there's not some plan that uh, once we get it in place for the rest of the public employees, then we'll get it in place for them maybe uh, two years down the road when the next biennium is. I'm not aware of any plan. Um, the firefighters have been um, marching in Madison just along with AFSCME, so obviously they think that that's at least a possibility. Um, and for example, uh, City Council in River Falls sent me a referendum saying well, we wish that they'd been included. Well, I mean, we got to get through this discussion sure. first before we can pick up and say, well, would it be better to expand that? And then we'll have to see whether the votes are there for that. Okay. So, uh, I, I, you know, unfortunately, the Democrat senators left the state, an unprecedented move that had a real chilling effect on compromise. To be honest with you, if you saw what happened, we had, it went to Joint Finance Committee, we had the longest public hearing in the history in that, in that it was a 17-hour public hearing in Joint Finance, and the outcome of that was an amendment. An amendment came out of it. And there were more amendments that could have come forward. I mean, I had... Well, didn't they offer a few amendments in the, in the assembly? Wasn't it like a hundred and every one of them got shot down? Well, I mean, most of those were designed more to obstruct the process or delay the process or simply, you know, for example, the reason there's a hundred was um, it was divided out to say, you know, we still want to have collective bargaining for the Jackson County Prison. Jackson Correctional Facility, uh, or we want to have it at um, UW Whitewater. And so every single state facility became a separate amendment just to, to lengthen out the, okay. the, the process and the time. So again there we set a record. We had 63 hours continuous floor session. Um, in the middle of the night I listened to largely the life history of some of them. Um, they were reading from all kinds of things, and um, they took turns, half an hour of speaking to just, to just delay, and, and ultimately everything that could be said was pretty well said. And uh, I just hope the senators come back and we can take this up. So how do you see this playing out then? Um, unfortunately for those Democrat senators, the... Um, the Indiana legislature had a similar thing happen. I don't know if you watched that, but again, Republican governor, he had a minority in Indiana, Democrats that decided they'd leave the state and also go to Illinois. While they were there, they made certain demands. We won't come back unless you do this. Um, that's not a very good way to do business. Most now, of the time when To someone, clarify, Wisconsin senators haven't done that. They, they didn't say the or else. Have they? Uh, with specific demands? I haven't talked with any of them. I mean, I've heard media reports, and you've, you've heard them say that until there's a compromise on this, we won't come back. But honestly, that isn't very much different than what happened in Indiana. So what, if what you happened followed it, the governor caved. He said, okay, we'll do that then. And they didn't come back. They stayed, and they said, oh, well, if you'll do that, then actually there's a few more things we want. 
And all of a sudden you've got the most undemocratic thing that you could have is you have one minority group who decides to actually pull up and leave the state and then start to dictate from afar when they took an oath to do a job and the job is here. I mean, when you take that oath that you'll represent the people, it, it says in the Constitution the seat of government is Madison, Wisconsin. So, I mean, they aren't doing their job. They need to come home. There is no win. There's a no win end game for them. Eventually, they'll come back. If they won't come back, the business of the state of Wisconsin is going to have to go on without them. And we'll have to figure out a way to do that. Will there be a shutdown? I don't think there will be a shutdown. You'll probably see a lot of legislation passed that they would have wished they could have been here to participate in. How would it be any different if they come back then? Yeah, are they going to be able to have their voice heard? Will there be any compromises on anything? I mean, on this issue? Yeah, if Scott Walker and, and the governor, you know, indicates that there is no compromise. On this issue? On this issue, why would he compromise on anything? Well, I mean, the place for compromise is, is within the process. I mean, we've got a long-established process for getting together and talking about things. You don't always get your way. Um, I mean, you want to contrast things. Last session, we had a budget repair bill. Governor Doyle introduced it one day. It went to Joint Finance Committee later that day. There was no public hearing. The next day, the majority Democrats passed it, increased taxes by $1.3 billion. They did that all in a 24-hour period. No public hearing, no public discussion. By the time the public got to know about it, it was over and a done deal. And this is about as far from that process as you could have. Longest public hearing in history. Longest public debate in history. You know, and yet what's happened by their absence is the Senate now has gone past the amendable stage for this legislation. I mean, they're going to ultimately come back and this will ultimately be passed. I don't see any I don't see any win end game for them. And think of the precedent. I mean, think of the precedent. They're doing this this time with a relatively small minority of you know, it's nineteen to fourteen, so the right. fourteen left. And that's a relatively small minority. We have often had in Wisconsin where we had seventeen, sixteen. If this is the precedent, only a few could leave. I mean, a few, a few from even both parties could just leave and, and, and hold up everything. Right. Once, once you accede to that kind of behavior, there is no end to it. So you can't. I mean, it's just like your kids. I mean, you, you, would, you have to say no no matter what the tantrum is. Sometimes they say, if you won't let me do that, I'm going to run away. Well, you know what? You still love them, and you're happy to see them come home. And probably your position hasn't changed very much when they come home, but they are going to, I mean, they will ultimately have to come home. Okay. Well, I think that's going to have to be it because we've really gone almost. All right. We could probably talk several more minutes, but I am going to be enthused to see what happens, and then we're going to probably have another discussion similar to this on Medicaid. And, on and Medicaid and the Medicaid changes. You know, we've got a, a, a great mind um, at in, in Madison that came from working in the Medicaid system in Washington. We've got a lot of innovative ideas. Kitty Rhodes is working along with that. Uh, and she's, a, she's also got great experience and background with it. We're well, going to make some good changes there. Okay, well, uh, thanks Dean, a lot. Yeah, well, thank you, Dean, Enjoyed for coming. Your new, new format and your new table. Thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us. We look forward to having you back again when uh, there's more.